Okay, so I have a lot of time to talk with you today, which is great because usually, you know, I have to do a 20 or 30 minute talk. Um, I'm scheduled to be here with you till 2, so I'll speak a little longer than I usually do. And I also will be here for questions, and you can ask me anything. I'm going to be covering a lot today, uh, so I hope I don't go too fast, but I do want to go through everything. And the first part of what I have to tell you might sound a little discouraging. So before I start that part, I want you to know that there is a silver lining. So I don't want you to get too discouraged. But basically, what I'm going to share with you is that we might want to rethink how we are positioning ourselves in the political arena. And part of that is because it's very hard to get a libertarian elected, as most of you know. And part of that is due to, oh, uh, how do I change the slides, by the way? Okay, yeah. If we could have the next slide, part of it, it's due to the wasted vote syndrome. And it was really driven home in 2008, just how bad this really was. Uh, you know, in 2008, the Libertarian Party was not on the ballot in Louisiana. <coughs> but Ron Paul was, and he was the only liberty-minded candidate on the ballot in Louisiana. He had been first or second in the Republican primary in Louisiana, depending on whose vote counts you look at. But in Louisiana, he only got 0.5% of the vote, which is the same amount he got when he was our libertarian presidential candidate in 88, and was pretty close to the amount that our 2008 libertarian uh, presidential party ticket job. And I think what this said to me, at least, when I looked at this data, is that even when somebody as popular as Ron Paul is the only person you can vote for to get liberty, too many people think that they need to vote for the lesser of two evils instead. And when I was on the LNC, we actually did surveys to see who was voting for us and who wasn't. And what we found is a lot of people who called themselves libertarians did not vote for us in the presidential election. And this is very sad because the wasted vote syndrome, I think, is a lot worse uh, than we ever thought it was. And if you get, uh, look at the next slide, you see that it doesn't help to then go to the major parties and run. We saw Ron Paul do that. And in 2012, he got enough, he won enough primary states that he could go and be nominated for the GOP uh, presidential party ticket. But at the last minute, after all the primaries were done, they changed the rules and said, no, it's not, and I, I'm not sure if I'm saying the exact numbers right, no, it's not five states you have to win, it's eight states. So he was automatically excluded from being nominated. So even if you run on, a, on one of the major party tickets, they're going to change the rules on you to keep you off the ballot or even, you know, off from getting reasonable numbers of votes. Um, and, you know, Stalin had said it's not the people who vote that counts, it's the people who count the votes. And if you go back one slide, if you could, you can see that there's a lot of suspicion about the current voting, especially the electronic voting. If you haven't seen Hacking Democracy, which is a really great film on this, you might want to take a look at it. And I think a lot of that material is now now contained in the black box voting the book. And so I, if you're, even if you get excited about running for office and think you have a great chance, there's always the possibility that we're going to have voter fraud. And when I was cam a campaign manager for the sheriff uh, in Kentucky in one of the counties there, my candidate went in to the vote count and he said every single box that had brought in from the precincts had a broken tape on it. You know, they tape everything so that it's, you, you know it's legit. Every single tape was broken. Some of them were mismatched. He had people come up to him and say, I voted for you absentee. 
he had at least two of his friends that said that. Well, he only got one absentee vote, according to the official count. So you know, you know things are happening. And I could tell you more stories like this. There's a lot of fraud that goes on. So going, moving on now to the next slide, um, there is a way out. Now, I've told you all the bad news. It's really tough to get elected as a libertarian. But now I want to talk about what happens when you run for office and lose and how you can win anyway, how you can roll back big government without electing anyone. Uh, as you see, um, this was uh, my first run as a libertarian for city commission. And uh, basically, we had four libertarians on our slate because that's how you ran for city commission in Kalamazoo. Uh, the Francis Hamilton joined us. He was what we would call a small L libertarian at the time. Uh, and this was 1983. And you can tell that because, of course, you know, you can see this wasn't made on a computer properly. This was a cut and paste job. I was looking at hairstyles. <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> that too. So, anyhow, nobody knew what a libertarian was back then. They kept calling us librarians. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or liberals. You know, they, they didn't quite get that. So, so, what happened is many of the people that were on the city commission board. Uh, knew that we were libertarians because we had been coming to the city commission meetings, getting up at the microphone in citizen comment areas and saying, okay, this is not something you should be doing because it's immoral or this is not something you should be doing because it's hurting people, whatever. So all of our city commission meetings were televised. So basically anybody who was interested in this could see what was happening. So the media decided that they would keep us from getting votes by telling everyone we were libertarians. And that sort of backfired on them. <laughs> because then we had to explain what libertarians were to everybody, which had been our intent. That's why we were running. And of course, in a nonpartisan race, you don't always get that opportunity. So we explained about the NAP. We explained about how taxation was theft. We did the whole thing. And remember, this is 83. We didn't have the kind of data we have today showing how harmful taxation is. We didn't. We were the only people calling for an end to the IRS, the only people calling for an end to the drug war. And, and we were able to do it and, and talk about the whole philosophy because of the media attack. Well, it turns out there were like four slates running, and the incumbents won. Not a big surprise. But our slate came in second, which was pretty good for the first showing of libertarians in Kalamazoo. And because Francis Hamilton uh, was on our slate, um, he had a very special position because what happened in Kalamazoo is that whoever got the most votes ended up as mayor. So since he got all of our slate's votes, as well as the incumbent slate, he became mayor by about 2,500 votes. And he was grateful. So what he did is he appointed Cheryl and myself to um, a public safety task force, which was kind of a do-nothing uh, committee, I guess you could say. But it was, you know, we, we were making our mark and moving forward as libertarians. And that was important to us at the time because, you know, this was kind of the beginning. But the big thing, the big, the big coup for this whole race came about six months later when the city commission decided that they wanted to do a rail consolidation. In other words, they didn't want people waiting for five minutes at the railroad tracks. They wanted to move these railroad tracks over the city of Kalamazoo's roads. And this was going to be a very costly thing, the most costly thing the city had ever done. Uh, it was going to require a bond issue, which was the biggest, basically, tax increase that the city had ever seen. And of course, we weren't too happy about that as libertarians. So we went to a meeting against this rail consolidation, and an elderly gentleman came up to me, and he, before he said a word to me, he put $200 bills in my hand. And he said, Dr. Ruhr, I know that your employer, Upjohn, who incidentally was Cheryl's employer too, <laughs> is going to profit from this rail consolidation because they are giving Upjohn 
Some of the land they're taking by eminent domain, so they'll go along. But one of the places they want to take is the bicycle shop that my brother and I have worked so hard to build up. But Dr. Ruart, I know you're on my side because you are a libertarian. So please take this money and fight it for us. And you know, I was kind of shocked. <laughs> I hadn't made the commitment before he gave me the money. I obviously had a conflict of interest, but that's how much he trusted libertarians because we had talked about our principles and we had shown that even when it was unpopular, we were able to stand up for them. And of course, the libertarians did join the other members of the town that did not want real consolidation, and we won. And we pushed back big government without electing anyone. And this is an important point. It is actually, in some ways for us, easier to change what happens at the government level without being in government. Let me give you another example. In the next slide, you can see what the um, Institute for Justice has been doing. Um, you know, they, they called themselves the Libertarian Litigators when they started, and they took on cases involving the disadvantaged and people of color who weren't able, for example, to uh, have a limousine service because the city wouldn't grant them a license. And they fought that and really made their mark doing that. Uh, and you may have heard about the African American hair braiders who were forced to either pay five grand and spend a year getting a cosmetology license just to braid hair, even though the cosmetology courses didn't teach braiding. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and this was out actually one of their biggest cases throughout the United States, and they were able to roll back these licensing laws that really prevented people from working. They're the ones that took eminent domain to the Supreme Court. Now, granted, they lost, but that didn't stop them. They started efforts in 50 different states to roll back eminent domain at the state level, and have been pretty successful in doing that. Uh, they put out a movie, The Little Pink House. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Yeah, uh, about this whole story. And now they have such a reputation that when a city government or state government even realizes that IJ is going to come and put in a brief, uh, they kind of back off because they know <laughs> they know that the Institute for Justice has a lot of power. And I want to talk about some other victories here that we have because you may not be aware of them. We never celebrated them. Um, Steve Cubby, an LP member, helped to organize Prop 215 in California in 96. Now that was the medical marijuana law the first state to pass medical marijuana laws. And now you see states not only passing <clears throat> medical marijuana laws, but they're passing uh, recreational marijuana. And this is going to kill the drug war, because most of the convictions uh, for the war on drugs are for marijuana possession. And that's because it's much easier to go after someone who smokes pot than it is to go after someone who's doing crack and, and might want to actually be violent. Most pot smokers are more peaceful. And then uh, Colorado LP, uh, back in, I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact time, it was in the 92. early 90s, pardon me? 92. 92, thank you. I was going to say the early 90s, but I'm glad you knew the date. That's right, you're from there. Paper, Were you part of this? Yes, I was. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they got a measure passed, so now the state can't hike up taxes unless <laughs> the voters approve it first. And of course the voters haven't approved many tax hikes, so that's really helped out. <laughs> we don't, we don't, you know, no one was elected in either of these cases, but you see, rolling back big government doesn't take us having to be elected. Uh, Carol Ann Rand, uh, really, I think, played a big part in sabotaging uh, Republican incumbent Bob Spar primary in 2004. And the way she did it is she ran ads, because she was running for that same office, she ran ads showing this lady in her hospital bed and saying, 
I need marijuana for the pain. It's my medicine. Why do you want to take it away from me, Bob Barr? Or something along these lines. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. I, it was on the web for a while. I wasn't able to find it, or I would have put the link. <laughs> but that really hurt him, because he was shown to be not very compassionate. And then, I don't know if you're aware of this, but really, libertarians were behind the defeat of Clinton Care in 93. And I know this because I was part of that effort. My collaborator, Jarrett Wolstein, and myself put out a book, Lethal Compassion, The Cure That Kills. And we went on radio shows and you know, really uh, explained what this would really mean. And of course, we weren't the only ones doing this. Just about everybody who put out something negative about um, Clinton Care back then was a libertarian. I recognized about 80% of the names. And when Obamacare came on the scene, a lot of that, a lot of those studies and verbiage was used to try to fight Obamacare as well. We weren't successful at that, but perhaps that's because we didn't celebrate and acknowledge how powerful we had been in fighting Clinton Care. Maybe if we had done that and organized for it, we, we could have uh, we could have defeated Obamacare. And then finally, uh, in recent times, the Goldwater Institute has gotten right to try passed at a national level. Now, some of you may not know the history of this, but as I'll show you in a little bit, the 1962 amendments to the Food and Drug Act changed the timeline from getting a drug to market from four years to 14 years. So when the AIDS patients were facing this 10-year wait they said, well, I don't think so. We're going to hire black market chemists to make what the pharmaceutical industry is, is working on. And before the FDA gave us permission to uh, test these drugs in people, every AIDS patient in the country who wanted them was already had had them and was resistant to them. So the reason I'm bringing this up is the cancer patients saw what the AIDS patients did and said, hey, we don't want to break the law like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to sue the FDA to get the right, if we are terminal, to use drugs that are not yet FDA approved. And initially, the courts agreed that was OK. Because what the, what the cancer patients were suing for was the right to life, as promised by the Constitution. They felt they should be able to fight for their right to life. When the FDA was unhappy with the decision and asked the courts to reconsider, they did. And the courts ruled that Americans have no right to save their lives without approved drugs. And so basically, right to try is the same thing that the cancer patients were asking for. But this time, Goldwater got it passed because what they did when they started putting it out there is all these patients who have been waiting for so long for new drugs, they were the ones that went to their state congressional districts. They were the ones that testified in front of their state legislatures. And state by state, right to try was passing. So finally, when Trump was elected, he said, I want to see this on my desk. And it happened. And again, Many of you know the Goldwater Institute is basically a libertarian nonprofit. So that was all done without electing anybody. Okay, so moving on, I just want to summarize where we are at this point in time. Of course, we should win races if we can. <laughs> I love it when a libertarian is elected. But the thing is, we need to, and I'll kind of go into this a little more in a bit. We need to make sure we tell people what we stand for. If we soft sell our message, it's very confusing to people. And I'll, again, I'll go into this in a little more detail in a minute. We want to be the ones that people come to when Big Brother comes knocking at their door. We want to be like that gentleman that put $200 in my hand, and, and, and or we want to be in the position that I was when that gentleman put the $200 in my hand and said, you know, I know you're on my side because you're a libertarian. That's what we want. Because that will tell us 
that will tell us where we need to roll back big government and where we can roll back big government. And that's how we should define winning, is rolling back big government. Because, you know, even if we elected a whole legislature full of libertarians, what good is it if we don't roll back big government? I mean, that's our real goal. And I think as a party, we've lost sight of the fact that our real goal is rolling back big government, not necessarily getting people elected. And of course, we can support coalitions that want to roll back big government. And I mentioned the nullification, the rightful remedy, because states actually have the power to nullify federal law, uh, at least in theory. Our Constitution promises that, but uh, you know, sometimes the federal government uh, doesn't acknowledge that. And of course, the nice thing is, is when you're helping people roll back big government, and you're working with them side by side, and you tell them you're a libertarian, they're going to ask you about our philosophy. Now you're somebody who's very credible to them. You can go and you can share the whole philosophy with them, and, and it'll be fine. And they'll, they will listen for a long time. So it's very important to, to do these kinds of things. Now, I talked about the... You know, I said I would continue on about this, not soft-selling the message. And I want to tell you a story. Uh, in the first bullet, you'll see one of the three things that I, I talk about when I go into a classroom. I tell the students, before I start doing anything else, that I want them to vote on which philosophy in life that they would like to see their government, the U.S. government, doing. Do they want the minority to rule the majority? Do they want the majority to rule the minority? Or do they want everyone else to rule themselves as long as they don't initiate physical force, fraud, or theft against others? 90 to 100 percent of the students raise their hand for the nap. <coughs> That's pretty impressive. But I don't tell them yet. It's the libertarian philosophy. <laughs> I ask him, okay, how do you perceive that the U.S. government operates today? And what we find is that 90 to 100 percent of the students believe that the U.S. government doesn't follow the map. But you know, it's, it's, it's exciting that that's what people are naturally inclined to vote for. They get it. They, they feel it in their gut, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Because one thing I want to do is I want to talk about the criticisms against the NAP that have appeared on the internet and, and somehow, uh, I mean, we even had a presidential candidate last time saying he didn't believe in the NAP. You know, that's the foundation of our party. And, but the reason I think that we get those criticisms is we don't talk about what I consider the second part of the NAP, <coughs> shown in the next slide. Restitution. Yeah. So the second part of the NAP is those who violate the non-initiation of force principle should restore their victims to the fullest extent possible. Because you know, I don't care how strong of a libertarian you are, I imagine that you can think of a place where you violate the NAP. So if I'm standing next to you on a street corner and I'm looking at my cell phone and I step out in the street and there's a truck coming and you pull me back. You initiate physical force against me. Am I going to be unhappy with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think so. I will not be asking you for restitution. But you see how the idea of restitution tempers when you can initiate force and when you can't. And if you looked on the internet, you've seen some absurd criticism of the map. Like, okay, if you're really a true libertarian and you're falling from a building and you grab on to this balcony and the guy comes out and says, that's my balcony, it's my property, I don't want you on it, get off. If you're a true libertarian, you'll fall to your death. I don't think so. <clears throat> Of course not. You'll stay on the balcony. You'll trespass to save your life. And you'll expect to pay restitution. Now, what's that restitution going to be? 
well, for most people, first of all, most people wouldn't react <laughs> the way our imaginary owner of that balcony did. They're going to say, oh, you're going to help pull you into the balcony, right? They're going to help save your life. But even if they don't, even if they want some kind of restitution, if they say, well, give me everything you own because I just saved your life, and you disagree with that, reasonably so, you're probably going to take it to an arbitrator, a judge, whatever the system is. And of course, that person is going to get a really bad rap in the media. And most people won't risk their reputation like that because, of course, it's, it's really kind of insane in a way not to want to help somebody who's, who's uh, you know, got in that situation. So what if you and I are hiking? Uh, and, and something, well, well, let's put it a different way. What if you and your child are hiking? And your child has an accident. And he's bleeding. And you're out in the wilderness. And you're, you don't know what to do, but you notice that there's a house. You know, some, maybe a vacation spot or something, a house there. And you want to have your... You want, to, you want to have that car that's in the garage or standing out in front of the house, but there's nobody home to ask. Do you put your child in the car and take him to the hospital? You probably do. Knowing you're going to have to pay restitution of some sort, and you don't even know what it is because you don't know how much inconvenience you're causing the other person. But again, as long as you're willing to pay that restitution, whatever it is, that sort of balances this whole initiation of force thing. And that's why I think it's very important to put that restitution into our principles. And that gets rid of a lot of the criticisms against the NAB. Now, I'd like to go to the next slide because there's something very important that I sort of skimmed over here. And that was that these students, when they heard the NAB, voted for it and recognized that the U.S. government doesn't operate that way. The NAP engages our instinct. And this is a good thing because we're animals in some ways. You know, we're, we've got the animal body, we have <coughs> animal instincts, and one of those instincts is to for, form our moral basis at kind of a gut level and then use reason to justify it. And I, I put down uh, this book uh, that I read recently by Jonathan Haidt, The Righteous Mind, which talks about this. If you haven't read the book, it's actually very interesting. He does talk about libertarians using reason more than other groups, which I thought was kind of interesting. But even if you're using reason to get to the nap, it's important for us as libertarians to understand that the NAP is really almost an instinctual thing. Because if we want to engage someone at the gut level, where most people are working, uh, then we need to consider that they will react very, um, you know, they will react very positively to the NAP. And if we don't talk about it, they're going to miss why we're doing all the other things we're doing, why we're calling for smaller government. So I think it is important to actually talk about that. And for me, when I see that our gut instinct as an animal is to go for uh, the nap, that just reinforces what my reason has already told me. <laughs> it works both ways. If they're not in alignment, there's something wrong. So the fact that they are in alignment is just another verification in my mind that this is the way to go. Okay, so now I've talked about how we can roll back big government without electing anyone, how it's important when we are working with people to share our philosophy at the, the base of the non-aggression principle, but we also have to apply the NAC and show people how we actually get solutions. So there's three solutions I'm going to talk about. The healthcare crisis, protecting the environment, and the relationship between government spending, jobs, wealth creation, poverty, and homelessness. Now, I know that's a lot. Uh, hang on one minute. I'm going to pick up my laser pointer, which fell while I was talking. I'm going to talk first about the healthcare crisis. I'm going to talk 
about pharmaceuticals because that's where my expertise is and where I uh, have, have written a book about, but it, this, everything I'm going to say applies to healthcare regulation in general. So, in 1962, as you can see, we used to take about four years of development, redevelopment as meeting the FDA regulations. So it took four years to get a drug from the lab bench to market. Since that time, it's gone steadily up because in 62, these regulations, these open-ended regulations were passed. Now it takes about 14 years to get a drug to market. And on the next slide, you can see the result of that. Now, here is the median year of approval for certain drugs. And here is the R&D for what we call an NCE, new chemical entity. So now here we're looking just at new drugs, not a new formulation like oral or IV. We're looking at really new drugs. And you can see that if the pre-amendment uh, trends had stayed the same, we would be having a cost of development hmm, somewhere down here, $100 million. Instead, as you can see, since the amendments, we are exponentially increasing the cost of getting a drug to market with no end in sight. So this is huge. And in the next slide, you can see that what, no surprise to, to us, of course, uh, but the amount of research and development per NCE that a manufacturer has to pay to go through the FDA regulations increases the average cost of a branded prescription drug. In other words, it's not a generic. And you can see the tight correlation here. Any economist, Economists 101 would tell you if the cost of the manufacturer increase, the price to the market does too. Okay, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but you can see this is why we have high drug prices. And it's not going to change because no one's addressing that, except libertarians. <laughs> now, if we got more safety because of these extra costs, we might say, okay, let's go along with them. But in fact, the rate at which we withdraw drugs from the market was about 2.5% before these amendments, and it's actually greater after the amendments. These amendments were supposed to keep bad drugs from getting to market, but they didn't. In fact, they were passed because of the thalidomide uh, incident, which happened in Europe. Thalidomide was approved in Europe, it created deformities when pregnant women <coughs> took it, and it was about 10,000 worldwide. Vioxx, on the other hand, was approved after the amendments, created 60,000 deaths. See, these are the FDA's numbers, not mine, the FDA's, and 140,000 heart attacks post-amendment. So these amendments haven't made us any safer. Uh, you might wonder why that is, and basically most safety issues, both pre and post amendment, uh, basically are because we don't know enough. State of the art testing isn't good enough, because if it were, we wouldn't put them on the market in the first place. And when you really think about it, uh, two and a half to three point three percent isn't really a big withdrawal rate. It's amazing to someone like myself who actually works with these things. I'm going. It's amazing that we are pulling more off. <laughs> that's, that's pretty amazing because our knowledge, unfortunately, is very limited. Most people think we know a lot, not so much. When you work in the field, you know better. <laughs> so bottom line on this is had pre-amendment trends continued, pharmaceutical prices would be about 5 to 10% of what they are today. This is true for all medical costs, but it's easier to measure for drugs because we regulate drugs nationally. We regulate health care state by state. So it's a little harder to make that calculation. But uh, there, are some, there are some libertarians who are researching this, and hopefully we'll come out with some numbers. OK. Um, instead, not only do these regulations not protect us, they actually kill us. Because we die waiting for drugs, we kill innovation, and most importantly, because of the way the amendments were structured, we've lost a lot of our knowledge about prevention. 
you have to be careful how you present knowledge about prevention or you get in trouble with the FDA. So we've, you, you know, there's been so many studies on drugs, you can actually make the calculation. We've each lost at least five years of our lives, or you can say half of us who die lose 10 years. And uh, that's what my book, Death by Regulation, talks about. Uh, I'm going to run out of copies at this convention, but I will, I will ship without cost to you uh, a book if you come and they're all out, and I'll autograph it for you, too. I just want you to know that up front. So let's talk about these solutions again. I talked about health care. And I want to talk about environment, because that's actually a big one, too. Something we libertarians don't do a very good job with. But you know, if you, if you look at what's going on, for example, with the rainforests, what you find out is that the rainforests are actually lived in. There are natives that live in the rainforests. They take care of them sustainably. And when our government or other governments decide to make a park, they generally drive these natives off or they hand the rainforest over to a corporate interest which pays a bribe to the government to take it over. And uh, if, you, if you all saw Sean Connery's movie Medicine Man back in, I think it was the 90s, you saw this being enacted um, and, and shown to the movie going public because Sean Connery had found a cure for cancer and uh, some corporation paid off the government and they mowed down the rainforest. In fact, a lot of the governments give subsidies to clear the land, even to farmers who do it. But um, the nice thing is that we can roll this back without electing anyone as well. And uh, one of the things that's going on now, I, I actually was engaged in the California, I'm sorry, the Kalamazoo Rainforest Action Committee. And what we did is we raised money for attorneys who would fight uh, on behalf of the natives for their homesteading rights. And in most um, underdeveloped countries, what's happened is the government retains title to land, and most people living there are squatters. So one of the things Liberty International has been doing is having the India Rights Project, raising money for it. One of our members is actually executing it. And what this does is they buy GPS units so farming communities can map out the boundaries that they've claimed through homesteading. And if they all agree, they can take that to the registry, what would be our registry of deeds, file a claim, and get what we call free and clear title because these people don't have free and clear title as we understand it. They can't get a mortgage, and, and they can get driven off their land if anyone complains, uh, you know, or if the government wants to use it for something. And uh, also, one of the speakers that we had at one of our conferences was mm -hmm. Oliver Porter, who those of you uh, who are in the Atlanta area, area probably know of him. Um, he actually is privatizing cities. He did this with Sandy Springs, and, and basically a group of like-minded people uh, privatized everything but fire and police in Sandy Springs, and it's been so successful that he now travels to other states and around the world showing people how to do this. And I wanted to share that with you because, again, it's a way of rolling back big government without electing anyone. So there are a lot of opportunities there. Another one is with endangered species. You know, a lot of people think we should ban hunting, for example, of, of elephants because that's going to um, make them pros that's going to make them prolific. But what actually happened in Kenya, which uh, actually did that, from uh, it had 65,000 elephants, it went down to 19,000 in the 20 years after the ban. Zimbabwe, on the other hand, took a different route. What they did is they actually gave the natives property rights in the elephants. They were allowed to hunt them in certain cases and cull the herds, sell the meat or the tusks, not the tusks, but the meat, uh, the hides, things of that nature. And so all of a sudden, instead of elephants being a problem, trampling crops and things like that, they became a valuable resource. The, the, the people who had been hunting them started to protect them 
And uh, that's why Zimbabwe has seen a growth. And actually, this 43K is the 90, is the 88 number. It's almost, almost doubled now. It's almost up to 60K. So that's pretty impressive. And that's happened with a cheetah, the black, and white rhino. And on the next slide, a number of other different, almost extinct species have been brought back because private ranchers or farmers have decided to bring them in and breed them. So that's what works. Privatizing, what I say, privatizing land and beast. But of course, on the next slide, you will see here is a species that cannot be easily domesticated. It is the snow leopard. And here in Seattle, you have the Snow Leopard Trust that figured out a way to solve this problem. I actually invited them. Did anyone come from Snow Leopard Trust? OK. Now, I love cats. You heard that in the introduction. So of course, I love this picture, and I love the idea of the Snow Leopard Trust, because what they do is they went into places like Mongolia and said, what's the problem? Why are you killing the snow leopards? And the farmer said, because they kill our goats. And if we lose a goat or two, you know, it's a major, a major problem for us. You know, our families starve. So what the Snow Leopard Trust did is it found ways to enclose the goats in a way that the snow leopards couldn't get in. It has an insurance program running where it gives low-cost insurance to farmers to protect their herds. And in order to get this insurance, they have to not kill snow leopards. <laughs> and they have a program where they increase the grazing land for the ibex, a horned goat, which is the snow leopard's natural prey. And that program was so successful that, at least for a while, they were selling hunting permits for the ibex for $5,000 a piece. That's incredible. And that money, of course, comes to the farmers. It's fantastic. So again, <laughs> the NAP really works. It helps protect the environment. And on the next slide, we'll go to the last bullet here, the business about helping the poor. And this is something that is very important. I mean, because this is what we've always run up against. People say we're selfish, that we don't care about the poor, that we have no compassion, and that somehow the poor would starve in a libertarian society. Well, this is just nonsense. It's the government that is creating most of the poverty in the world today. We talked a little bit about that when we talked about how government doesn't make it easy to get free and clear title to lands in developing countries. But you know, bad things happen in the US too. If you look at this slide, what you see is that at, uh, from 1955 to 1980, as the minimum wage coverage of more and more jobs increased, the ratio of um, black male employment to white male employment plunged. This was teenagers now. So what happened is, when they had a minimum wage, the blacks who were discriminated against couldn't negotiate with their employers. Because what they used to do is say, hey, OK, I know you don't want to hire me, but you have to pay this white boy X number of dollars, and you could pay me 10% less. Now, this isn't good that they had to do that. It wasn't good that there was this discrimination, but what was good about it is instead of having no job at all, the blacks had some job. And once they got experience and proved themselves, if the employer didn't want to give them a raise, they could probably find somebody who would because now they had that all-important experience. And we can go into a lot of stories on that, but uh, I, I want to make sure we keep moving on. So on the next slide, you see how each federal regulator destroys about 170 private sector jobs per year. How do we know this? Well, because from 1980 to 1990, we saw the number of federal regulators going down. These are the Reagan years. And then when he was gone, the number of regulators got rehired. And look at what happened to private sector job growth. It went way up when the regulators were gone, and then went way down when they came back. So you can actually see what happens here. So this creates poverty, because if you, if you can't 
find a job because there are no jobs because they've been destroyed, obviously you're in trouble. If you can't get a job because you know, you're not trained yet enough to get the minimum wage, you can't get a job. You live in poverty. And when government spends less, uh, the GDP, which is a, a measure of how much wealth we're creating, increases. You can see down here that countries that where the government spends greater than 60% of the GDP, mm, they don't have very much wealth creation going on. But when it's less than 25%, look at that. And in fact, countries, this is, and you know, this is, this is not like hidden knowledge or anything. When New Zealand was going to go bankrupt, they changed what they did. They lowered tariffs, lowered taxes, <laughs> stopped regulations. And you can see on the next slide what happened when they did that. Their GDP <coughs> uh, went from, <laughs> you can see way, way down here to way, way up here virtually overnight. This was almost a fourfold increase. And this has happened in uh, Great Britain and in Ireland as well. They, when, when Ireland did this for a short time, and let me just see, 74 to 92, they called, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place, 1960 to 1986 for Ireland, they called it the Irish miracle. They couldn't figure out how it happened. <laughs> but the people who engineered it knew how it happened. They lowered taxes, lowered regulations, and lowered tariffs. And lo and behold, virtually overnight, the country can recover. And this is another message that we as libertarians can give to the rest of the country. You know how we're in debt and there's like no way to pay off their debt? I mean, one way to pay off the debt if we wanted to honor it would be to increase our, our rate of wealth creation by deregulating, lowering taxes, creating more wealth. That means we can pay off the debt. No other political party has that solution because they don't understand how it works. This is, this is something we can bring to the table. It's very important because wealth creation really is, is a very important thing. It's truly a matter of life and death because the number of years that we live is highly correlated to the uh, amount of wealth that a country creates. So this is very, very important. Now, I know here that you have a, an issue with homelessness. I want to talk about that a little bit. There's been a lot of studies done on this, and about 50% of the homelessness is, is really due to local regulations, like building codes, zoning restrictions, rent controls. I'll give you an example of what happened in New York. Uh, Mother Teresa's order of nuns decided they wanted to help the homeless in New York. So they were going to buy a condemned building, fix it up, and let the homeless people live there. And uh, initially, the government said, that's fine. But then when they actually bought the building, the city inspector came through and said, oh, well, you have to have elevators. And of course, they were very expensive to put in this old building, so the nuns didn't want to do that. The project eventually had to be scrapped, even though the nuns said, hey, you know, the homeless don't care. They'll walk up the stairs. <laughs> but the city buildings inspector wouldn't back down. This is how ridiculous it gets. It's, it's really tragic. Um, so, uh, and also, in my experience working with welfare tenants, you do have to have an address to get a welfare check. By definition, the homeless don't have that. So they rely on the private sector pretty much for their sustenance. Um, but uh, there's been at least 70 cities at last count in the U.S. that have actually outlawed feeding the homeless. Uh, they do it in different ways. Sometimes they just outlaw it. Sometimes they make it, so, you know, you have to have a license to feed the homeless. You have to be taxed if you want to feed the homeless. Uh, recently, a World War II vet was arrested in Florida. He's been feeding the homeless for 25 years. And he was arrested because he continued to do it even after the city made it illegal. Now, in Dallas, you know, the state of Texas, <laughs> uh, the group Don't Comply had been doing these holiday uh, meals for the homeless and giving them clothes, warm clothes for the winter. And when Dallas outlawed feeding the homeless, they strapped down their guns 
and started feeding the homeless. And I think the police wisely decided not to engage them and enforce the law. <laughs> Does it come to this where we have to put on firearms so that we can feed those who are homeless? Where's the compassion in that? We have so much ammunition today to show how government doesn't work, but is the least compassionate option. We shouldn't have any trouble selling our philosophy. And if you're interested in more of the kind of stuff I just presented, other than the, um, the drug regulation, which of course is in death by regulation, these are the two books you should look to. Healing Our World has all the details and over a thousand references. Short Answers is from my column that I wrote uh, for the advocates for I think almost 20 years. And I'm just going to sum up uh, and say that uh, obviously something you have known before I got up on the podium, <laughs> government doesn't work. And if we run as LP candidates, we can point that out. And of course, pointing out the ethical basis of liberty, which resonates so much with people, so much and be the who do you call when big government comes knocking on your door group. Don't need to elect anyone for that. Support, uh, you know, kind of local things like referenda, uh, propositions. Help people understand what the free market solutions are. And I call this the PDQ path to liberty. Uh, for those of you who might not know what PDQ means, pretty damn quick or pretty darn quick, uh, I think it's going to beat trying to get us elected, because even if we're elected, if we can get over all those hurdles we have to getting elected, and I'm not against getting elected, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but if, we, if we, we're going to have trouble getting over those hurdles, we'll have to put a lot of energy into it, and then when we get elected, we won't be a majority, so we'll have a limited impact. If you think of what Ron Paul did in Congress, he was a great watchdog for us, but he wasn't able to change a whole lot. And you know, I'm, I love Ron Paul, I think he's great, he's been very generous to me, you know, but I think he would say the same thing. We don't need to wait to get elected to roll back big government. And I'd like to get liberty in my time. <laughs> so that's where I dedicate my efforts. Thank you so much. Questioner's prerogative, can I ask a quick one? Of you mentioned the, uh, um, the drug regulation and the time to market has gone uh, a long time and it's yeah. 10 times the cost. Uh, my brother's in the pharmaceutical industry with Big Pharma and he says one of the reasons is that uh, they'll take your initial study and go, okay, that's great, but you don't have enough blacks, don't have enough Hispanics, and they make you do it all over again. Right. He says that's just a matter of routine. From your, your experience, what are the major contributors to that 10x increase in development cost. Well, it's the fact that the FDA can tell you to do anything they want, and you really can't say no. If you do, you jeopardize all of your future prospects. In fact, that's why you probably haven't heard this before. Yes, there are private conversations like you have with your relative. But if I were still at a pharmaceutical industry, I would not dare speak up. And the reason is, is that the FDA would very likely punish the company I work for by dragging their feet. You have to make so many meetings and contracts and time with the FDA, and they can drag their feet at any step of the way. And they're going to. Now, looking at, now, looking at it fairly from their perspective, realize that if a drug has side effects that get to the attention of the media, <coughs> the Congress will blame the FDA and beat up on them. And in a way, it's not fair to them because every drug has side effects, right? So it's just a matter of time before they're going to get in trouble. So every time they can think of a different study, like, oh, OK, so this side effect could happen, so we'll do this study and have the company redo those studies, because maybe, maybe it will happen differently with the blacks, right? So they go back, and what they're doing is the CYA routine, right? Uh, because their job depends on it. So in a way, they've been put in an unfair position, because they've been told they can only let drugs get to the market if they're safe and effective. And there is no such thing. 
There's no drug that's totally safe. There's no drug that works in everybody. So they have given the FDA a charge that they cannot fulfill. And consequently, they, they do a lot of stuff to make sure that if they're criticized, <laughs> they can fall back and say, oh, but we have this study done. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. curious and in fairness to the the FDA it seems to me that 50 years ago the drugs that were being test uh, developed and the illnesses that were being fought were relatively much more simple and widespread than they are today and more the, more and more of the drugs that we are seeing are very uh, laser pointed at a particular disease or a disease that has never actually been able to be successfully treated before. And so could that enter into the why we are also seeing an increase in the developmental costs? Well, you know, that, that sword cuts both ways. Let me explain. I mentioned very briefly that we've lost the, our knowledge of prevention because it has been, it has been killed by, or almost killed, uh, by the amendments. So let me give you an example. In the early 80s, we knew that the B vitamin, folic acid, could prevent neural tube defects. And the folic acid manufacturers wanted to advertise this fact because young women needed to be taking it in the first month or two of pregnancy when they usually didn't even know they were pregnant. But the FDA told them that they had to jump through all these regulatory hoops to make that claim. And of course, they couldn't because it was off patent. They'd never recovered their development costs, which had gone, gotten huge, right? So instead of letting the American public know about this, it was not until the early 90s when the Center for Disease Control, another government agency, started making that recommendation. But the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers, if you even mention that the CDC is saying this, you know, we will prosecute you. So uh, then the FDA turned around and said, OK, yeah, this does prevent the neural tube defects. So let's put it in food. So then they demanded that manufacturers of grain products put folic acid in their food. So young women didn't know how much they were getting. So they didn't know how much to take. And, and that didn't work very well for us. Meanwhile, in, in the Netherlands, I think it was, um, they advertised the benefits of folic acid, and their neural tube defects really dropped. Now, I, I went in this long, involved story because many of the diseases that we have today, like diabetes, heart disease, things like that, have a big prevention component. And there is knowledge out there that could be used to change the way we do things and have, instead of things like statins, have drugs, have, have, sorry, have nutrients that do the same thing with fewer side effects. So, it, so it's a long-winded answer to your question because it's complicated. In other words, some of the, these complicated diseases actually have a very simple solution, but the amendments have actually prevented the American public from being aware of it. Now, also in your book on compassion and charity, do you discuss the Stryker family and the Kalamazoo Promise? I don't, because no, that came out, uh, the promise came out after that book was published, yeah. I did update it, I could have probably put that in there, but that, that wasn't, for some reason that just didn't uh, make the cut, shall I say. The book was getting so thick that I had to stop well, somewhere. Explain, explain how private sources, sources can help in a very important educational issue like the Kalamazoo Promise. Yeah, Thomas. well, I mean, actually, I'm, I thought that was a, that was not just, I thought that was not just private, but also public. I thought there was a tax component. Am I wrong? I don't believe, I don't believe it's tax supported at all. I think okay. it's entirely privately endowed. Okay, well, what we're talking about is that, um, well, actually, why don't you go ahead and explain it? Because I think you know a little more than I do about it. Now, Kalamazoo, now, Kalamazoo historically was a pharmaceutical. I guess Upjohn became or was absorbed by Pfizer, which is still there. A lot of a lot of stuff in Kalamazoo, but the Stryker family, uh, which makes m large medical instruments, um, and other people decided that 
people in uh, most high school graduates in Kalamazoo didn't have the means to go on to a four-year university no matter how bright they were and so they created the Kalamazoo Promise and that is if you go uh, to Kalamazoo school system for the 13 years you get a four-year education at the level of something like the University of Michigan. Now they, they've spread it out now that you can use that same amount of money and go to other schools like Kalamazoo College for example which are liberal private arts and if you own only go for eight years, well, you get two-thirds of that. And so they give a generous stipend for people who go through the Kalamazoo public school system and graduate, um, and it's not, it's not uh, government funded. And Arizona has a charter school system, which I think, it, at least initially, um, there were a bunch of private businesses that got together and gave scholarships to those schools, too. Yes. So, so I have a, another kind of medication-related question. Uh, one of the things that we're getting a lot of political interest in these days is is what's called the the opioid epidemic, and uh, you know people have uh, they they start taking opioid medications because they're injured or something, and then when the doctor cuts them off, they end up going to heroin, and of course that causes a lot of homeless issues and things. Is there a libertarian solution to the opioid ep epidemic? Well, I think part of the, you know, the person, I, I should refer you first to the person I think who has a better grasp on this than I do, and that's Dr. Kyle Varner, who's part of your uh, membership, I believe. And and he's actually, he's actually the one to ask. But from what I recall from what he said, um, and, of course, part of this is related to the drug war. You know, um, there are things like marijuana that people could use to relieve pain uh, and not have to use a more addictive narcotic, uh, but those have been banned. And there's no um, incentive, really, to, to use plant products, which could be helpful in this, because the FDA makes it very hard to get a plant product on the market. Uh, so, so that's a big part of it. Uh, the other thing is, you know, if people are, uh, this, this business about being concerned that people are taking mind-altering drugs in general, I think harkens back to the fact that people are rather discouraged. I mean, why would you take an addictive drug unless you were having so many problems that you needed an out that badly. I, th I think there's a lot of that going around too. And why is that? It's because the government has meddled in the economy so much. It's tough. You know, when I was young, we expected to do better than our parents. But the children today, a lot of times, don't expect that. I, I have stepchildren who do not think they can do better than their parents, or even as well. You know, the economy has changed, and it's changed because of all these government distortions of the market. So I personally think a lot of the problem are the same things we talk about in a political manner that impact on the way a person can live their life. So even though a person might not appreciate the idea of liberty, they feel the impact in other ways. And I really think that that's a major issue. And until we address that, we're never really going to address the problem of people wanting to take drugs to escape from this mess we're in. So until we clean up the mess, they're still going to want to escape. Thank you. Dr. Wood, I've asked you online if you would run uh, for president again, and you've, you've pretty strongly said no, so I won't ask you that at this point. But, <laughs> but would you uh, like to weigh in on the 2020, you know, the field of, of candidates already declared, um, either specifically or just kind of like on general you know, characteristics of what we as the Libertarian Party might want to look for in a in our next presidential candidate? Well, I have to say that I haven't vetted all the candidates, so I'm not going to name names or anything, but I will say that I think it's very important that we run somebody at the top of our ticket who can explain the non-aggression principle or at least allude to it enough that we attract people who are attracted to the non-aggression principle. 
I mean, it's very different to say, I'm for the non-aggression principle than I'm for small government. It is not the same thing. And the thing is, when we run somebody at the top of our ticket, we have to recognize that the characteristics that they have are the characteristics that the new libertarians are going to bring in. So the last couple rounds, we have run, um, we have run people who had come from the Republican Party and pretty much went back to it. Yeah, because the commitment wasn't there. The commitment to liberty wasn't there. The commitment to the map wasn't there. In fact, the candidates did not enunciate the map. They did not allude to it even. And, and you know, the NAP is what gets people excited and emotional. I, I just can't tell you, when I go into a classroom of people who really know nothing about libertarianism, and I did this mostly in the 80s and 90s, and, you know, you get 90 to 100 percent of them voting for the NAP and getting so excited about it, and they want to know, you know, what can we do? We pass papers around to sign up people for the, you know, for more information, and we usually got about a third of the class responding. That's pretty good. That's what, that's what people are excited about, a world where they don't have to worry about force being initiated against them, you know? They, they can see, they can feel that that's, that's what they want. And that's what our presidential candidate needs to be firing up in people. Because, you know, when we were on the ballot in 50 states the first time, we, we did have some paid petitioners, but most, mostly it was volunteer. You know, we worked our hearts out. And, and it was because we had the passion for it. You know, there's, there's something that resonates, I'm going to say, almost at a spiritual level with an app. And that's what you want to tap into. And not to tap into it is losing a huge chance. Um, how can we better reach out to minorities? Uh, earlier on, you had the, the slide showing um, that uh, uh, black males specifically um, as, as uh, the minimum wage goes up, their uh, electability goes down. So they're unemployed, their life sucks, and tying together with the drug war, they turn to drugs. Um, how can we better reach out to the minority community um, to let them know that our principles would improve their lives actually more than other groups? That's a really good question for a couple of reasons. Uh, I always like to refer to Walter Williams. He's a black economist. Thomas Sowell, another black economist. I think, I think using, um, using people of the same color is helpful. But also, I've also seen that oftentimes, rather than considering those ideas um, in a way, in a rational way, there's a there's a pushback against them of oh they're they're Uncle Tom's you know they're catering to the white message, so it's not an easy thing because they have really been brainwashed, and uh, to think that um, that they're victims and yes in a sense they are victims, but the thing is when you think of yourself as a victim, then what you're thinking is I need a hero to save me, instead of doing it yourself. And that doesn't, that doesn't work in the long run. So empowering, uh, that's why I like the Institute for Justice so much. They empower blacks who are struggling to get that taxi license or the, the limo license or, or the hair braiding uh, business going and they're squashed by government. That's when you can really make a difference. If you find that in your community, point to it and say, this is what government does to you. You know, and, and actually, I send a lot of people to the Institute for Justice website where they can see those stories. And I think that that's a big, a big thing. I'm actually thinking about doing a fiction book around all this. <laughs> because I think sometimes it's easier to make your case in fiction. But uh, I don't know if I'll pull that off or not. <laughs> Um, 
might as well lump some of the uh, political process questions together on terms of uh, minority outreach. Have you talked with uh, Maj Torre, who's now running for uh, city council in Philadelphia and is founder of Black Guns Matter? And here in Washington, you know, you're talking about um, some of the political issues with uh, not wanting to be the spoiler vote, and so why libertarians don't get um, uh, vote totals. Uh, that Washington State has the top two, which has some interesting effects in that political parties do not control access to the ballot. And uh, wondering if you had studied that, and that's also uh, either been a change or is talking about being a change in California, Arizona, and a couple other states. I, I don't think I'm the one to address a good analysis of that because I haven't studied it, and I just want to be real upfront with you about that. Um, what I have heard from California libertarians is they feel it's really upset their ability to run candidates, the top two right. um, specifically. And um, you reminded me, though, when you mentioned um, the black woman, was that we've had we had some we had some pretty serious black candidates. So one in New York that ran for governor, uh, Larry uh, Sharp. Sharp. Thank you. Uh, you know, he's a good role model, and he was an excellent. I saw him speak. He was an excellent person to speak uh, and address minority concerns. So it would be it would be interesting if we could get people like that to address minority groups on a, on a larger basis. Matches a dude. Hmm? Matches a dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, matches Yeah, well, you know, this is, yes, I think coming from, it's easier to come from um, a person that you see as similar to yourself. So it, it's always a good thing to, to do. Anything else? Sure. <clears throat> uh, so, okay. wait, wait, wait for the microphone, though. I've been, I've been instructed to okay, tell you, wait sorry. for the microphone so we get it on tape. And, and there was another hand raised over there, too, I saw. Okay. <laughs> so, your first, so, your first part of your uh, presentation, you spoke about um, the second part of the NA, uh, NAP for restitution. Do you have any examples of where that's worked um, as a judicial code or anything yes. in the U.S. Yes. or around the world? Thank you for asking that question. Um, Actually, Japan has a system not too dissimilar from what I imagine could work here. And we've actually had some in the United States as well. So in Japan, if I stole from you, for example, what would happen before we even went to trial is that my family members or my attorney or somebody would approach you on my behalf and say, OK, Mary knows she did you wrong. What, what, is, what do we need here to make it right again? And there'd be a negotiation. And then if you were satisfied with the negotiation, when we did go to trial, you go up to the judge and say, OK, Mary's admitted she did me wrong, and she's going to pay this restitution, and I'm happy. So go easy on her, judge. <laughs> and so I would get a slap on the wrist, basically. But if I didn't negotiate in good faith, then I would probably get a more severe punishment. The nice thing about this is most criminals start not with the big homicide, they start with something small, like stealing. So if they get caught early on and have to pay restitution, they realize that crime doesn't pay. So they stop. And so Japan, the last statistic I saw was that Japan has is the only um, developed country that since World War II has had decreasing violent crime all the time. Now, in the U.S., it's been tried, too. Of course, in a libertarian society, part of that restitution would be probably paying court costs. But um, it's been tried in the U.S., but it's been on a very limited basis. But where it has been tried, what they do is they often have the victim and the aggressor sit down in the same room and talk to each other. And this has actually been very healing for the victim. They get to tell the aggressor, all the horrible stuff that happened to them because, you know, their paycheck was stolen or whatever, and they get to vent. Which, you know, if you think about it, in a regular court case, that wouldn't happen. 
you just have to stick to the facts, right? You don't get to talk about your feelings and all the problems and stuff. And that's been very healing to the victims. And in some cases, the victim and aggressor have actually, I, I wouldn't say become friends, but you know, they've had a better understanding and sometimes the aggressor works off the restitution with some service to the victim. And that's very healing. And if you think about it, it's so important to heal because you, know, you throw somebody in jail and that doesn't help, or you give them probation, the victim doesn't get anything. The victim's not healed. The, the person who is the aggressor generally feels like the punishment and the crime don't fit. But when they have to, when they have to um, make the victim whole again, that's a whole different story. Then they get it, you know, then the light bulb goes off. So I, I think restitution is a great thing. Behind you, behind you. So I have a question. The NAP, when you apply it to things, big things like crimes, you know, theft, uh, the idea of restitution makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm wondering if you have any advice for smaller things, like uh, when you get in an argument with somebody, or uh, especially on social media, things can get really tense between people, especially when you don't have that face-to-face -face, uh, connection. How, what, how can we apply the NAP, especially as libertarians within our own community, to try to um, build up and use it as a unifying principle to make ourselves stronger? I was just wondering if you had any advice on that. Yes, actually, I'm really glad you asked that question because uh, you know we tend to be very hard on each other um, and, and negative to each other one of the things that I noticed and, and shocked me in 83 when I ran for president I I didn't think anyone would take me seriously I just wanted to get some ideas out <laughs> uh, but they did and in doing that I saw that libertarians break the promises from other libertarians I saw how nasty we are to each other and you know there's another level in which, okay, then that's about physical uh, aggression. But you can have emotional aggression too. And that's, that's been our downfall. Um, judgment against each other in a very negative way has, in my opinion, been the single thing that has stopped us from getting the liberty that we want. Because we can get liberty without electing anyone. And, um, I think we need to extend, oh, I don't know that we need to, but I, I think we would be well served, let me put it that way, to extend the nap into the emotional arena. So, um, for example, in the early days of the Libertarian Party, if there wasn't total alignment with the nap right away, people often felt driven away. In fact, what would happen, and I know some of you are old enough to remember this, when, when the libertarian candidate for president was selected, the loser often left the party. In fact, they were booed and driven out, essentially. Which, you know, when you think about it, somebody's giving you a choice, right? You know, that's, they put a lot of time, money, and effort into giving you that choice. You don't want to alienate them. They're one of the golden people, right? They're one of the people who are going to make things happen. So, you know, we really need to think about being nice to each other. <laughs> I mean, you know, and if you take it, okay, and, and I know that um, spirituality isn't talked a lot about in the Libertarian Party, but maybe it should be, because this is almost, I'm going to elevate it to a spiritual principle, not a religious principle, a spiritual principle. So, um, I've had people come up to me and say, oh, you know, it's so discouraging being a libertarian. You see things getting worse all the time. Nothing's going to happen. We're going to go downhill, blah, blah, blah. And I say to him, if you could uh, change things so that you never learned about libertarianism and were ignorant of it, you could be like the rest of the people you know, that don't know any better. Would you make that choice? Guess how many people said yes? Nobody. And do you know why? Because when we learn something, when we know something, I'm going to go this way so I can see better. <laughs> when we know something to be truth, it elevates us. It elevates us in spirit. However you want to take that. <laughs> and 
And truth elevates us. You know, we say the truth will set you free. Yeah, this is part of it. When you hear the nap, you know it's truth. And you know if nobody else does it or gets it, you still wouldn't take that knowledge away from yourself. This tells us, <laughs> this tells us that this is more about more than politics, which is why we need to be nice to each other. We need to hold each other's hand and, and recognize, okay, you know, we're not all the same. Mm, the other person might take drugs and I think it's stupid or something, but, you know, they're out there getting ballot access signatures, whatever. They're helping make the world a better place. And so I'm going to work with them on that aspect and not beat each other up. We're our own worst enemies. If we could bring back all the people into the party that were run out by the nastiness. <sighs> <laughs> if this, Washington's not just Washington State, it's everywhere. I, I love coming to small groups like this because usually at the county level, things can be cooler <laughs> and more friendly. But you start getting into the state committees and national. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you run for president, it gets pretty nasty, too. <laughs> well, Mary, um, a question or an observation. When I think of Democrats and I think of Republicans and I think of socialists and all of those, that's essentially a political philosophy. But libertarianism is a life philosophy. So I think the point you were making about would you make those changes and people would say, no, my libertarian philosophy helps me personally even if, even if no libertarian is ever elected. That's right. That's right. And actually, I'll add to that because, you know, there was a time in the early days when we're looking around and going, Nothing's going to happen. It's all going downhill. And I had to ask myself, why am I spending all my time and money doing this? And, you know, I had the same reaction. You know, it was like, I have to, even if we're not, even if we're not going to succeed. Because something's calling for it. You know, something inside's calling for it because it's truth. <laughs> well, it makes, well, it makes your, life. your life better yes, as exactly. well. exactly. That's exact. I, I was trying to, I was trying to say that. You know, there's, a, there's definitely a... When you're out there working for truth, it changes your life in a good way. It changes the way you look at the world. It changes the way you feel about you and yourself. You know, it's, it's not just about politics. <laughs> yes, that's important. I, I, I mean, it's very important because it determines whether you eat or not. But even at a higher level, it's about what happens inside of you. So it's, it's a win-win thing. It's almost selfish to want to be working for a libertarian world. <laughs> I thought, did I hear it, see another question? OK, go ahead. Mary, you are a breath of fresh air. Thank you so much for being here today. And I love what you're saying about sort of the spiritual nature of this. Um, I'm right there with you. And as you talk about um, truth, you know, we're we need to speak the truth in love. And you'll notice um, the Libertarian Party, of, or excuse me, Libertarian Party of King County, we're love, logic, liberty. So I just love your compassionate libertarian positioning. With that, uh, when we consider the issues um, that our candidates might be running on, or we as we're, you know, doorbelling and talking to our friends and neighbors, if we were to put together a matrix of like three issues, as you sort of travel around, talk to a lot of people, what would be the top three issues that you think would resonate to the general pop population? That's a very good question, and I'm not sure it's the same in every area, but um, certainly um, the whole business about poverty, enrichment, um, the economy stupid kind of thing, that's a biggie for everybody because most people do connect how well the economy is doing with their own ability to live a prosperous life. So that's a biggie. And we as libertarians really hold all the cards in that arena and we have not used them. So that, that's one. My personal belief is that liberty may very well turn on the whole health care issue. And I include, I include medical marijuana in that. Um, the reason I say that is if you talk to people who are in the alternative health care movement, 
they already know the FDA is not a good thing for them. They already know that government health care is not a good thing for them. They may not be libertarians, except in that area. But that's a biggie, because that's a matter of life and death. And once they get it there, it's an easy transition to bring them the rest of the way. And we have neglected that. I mean, the founders of Life Extension Foundation, uh, who really were the first people to stand up to the FDA when their attorneys said, hey, you brought coenzyme Q into the country and sold it and said how great and wonderful it was, but the FDA is going to put you in jail. It's not going to matter. And they stood up and said, we're going to fight them. And they won. That was a big victory because the whole prevention industry changed after that. I mean, there's a lot of things going on in the healthcare industry at all different levels. And you know, the healthcare workers, they're our biggest ally in a way because they have to follow these regulations. The nurses and the doctors and stuff, they get it. You know, a lot of them get it. Of course, a lot of them are too afraid to do anything about it. I have to tell you that too. So anyhow, that's a biggie. So I'd say that's a big one. What the third one is? Well, I have to leave that one to your imagination and say, and say pick the local one because it's different in each locale. But the poverty and the health care, I think, are the, the two biggies that I see. And it's kind of a follow-up to, to that. How come military intervention abroad isn't in that top three? I remember when Trump was elected, I thought, well, this is horrible, but at least I'll get my anti-war liberal friends back. <laughs> you know, they had forgotten they were anti. Uh, after eight years of Obama, they they were not. You know. I had been, they were with us, you know, in uh, protesting when there was a Republican in the White House. They forgot all about it, so I thought, well, at least they'll come back now. They're, they can protest again and be against um, bombing uh, people around the world and against uh, the Patriot Act and stuff like that. As far as I can tell, they haven't come back. Uh, maybe they've just gone numb to it. Uh, and what can we do about it? Is it a messaging problem? Oh, I'm really glad you asked that because. <laughs> that probably should be the third issue on the list. Um, and actually, you also said this business about numbing. I think that's what's happened. And in the Libertarian Party, for those of you who aren't familiar with this history, you know, when we first um, went into Afghanistan after 9-11, there was a big split in the Libertarian Party. And the people who left were the people who didn't want to go into Afghanistan. I've had many, many Libertarians come up to me and say, Boy, that was a bad mistake. You know, they had supported going in, and they realized now they kind of got sucked in. Unfortunately, the people that were pro-war in the Libertarian Party were in the majority, and they did kind of, again, you know, we tried to have a very, one of the conventions we tried to have a debate um, about this in a very civilized way. And I think we did a pretty good job staying civilized, but I think that the people who were against the war got discouraged and left. And, and this is another, okay, so this is another wrinkle on something we talked about earlier, about driving people out of the party. It's a delicate balance between wanting to have people of like mind in the party so that we can forge ahead uh, in a very unified way and tolerating other opinions, and yet being somewhat fearful that those other opinions will prevail at the wrong time. And there's no easy answer that I've come up with on that. One of the things, though, that we used to do that prevented that, that we don't do today, and we should be doing, is education. There was a big rift in the Libertarian Party. There's a big segment of the party that does not believe the LP should educate its members in all of the issues. And part of the reason is it's kind of the like the Republican light wing of the Libertarian Party. And, uh, you know, obviously they believe that we can get more votes if we're Republican light. I, I think that's a terrible strategy. Uh, I think Ron Paul showed us that, no, liberty is what gets people enthused. So 
And so I think it's a terrible strategy, but that has really hurt us because the LP does not make an effort to educate. And since Sharon Harris of the Advocates retired, the Advocates has not been doing much in that realm. Um, Liberty International, which used to be International Society for Individual Liberty, actually used to do a lot of that before the Advocates came along. I learned my libertarian principles from the little trifolds that the International Society for Individual Liberty put out. We had a discussion every week uh, with these trifolds. We looked at all the different issues. We debated them, you know, and and because of that, we understood the principles. We don't do this anymore. So what's happening is we aren't because we aren't working these things. Because people who try to work them are are basically vilified in the party. Uh, we're we're losing our ability to align on the issues and really understand the proper application of the map. Now, we can disagree on that, <laughs> but we should be discussing it, you know? We should be discussing it, and we're not. So if I had any advice to give to Kings County, uh, King County LP, it's that educate your numbers. And one of the things that the uh, Liberty International is thinking about doing is taking up the banner since the advocates are no longer doing that. So we're trying to revitalize our pamphlet series, do video pamphlets since video is the way to go these days. Um, and um, we actually were trying to have a course on the internet where all our board members would come on with their specialties and talk about these issues and be able to get live feedback from the audience. That's something that didn't materialize uh, because the Entities that we were trying to work with just it wasn't wasn't right for them at the time. But I would say that's that, pretty diplomatic, right there. <laughs> <by> the <way. laughs> well, you know, everybody's got their angle. I I'm I'm cool. But the reason I'm sharing this with you is if any of you are excited about something like that, let me know because in a big enough group, we might uh, we might be able to do something around that and and really. If we aren't discussing the issues, you know, we're going to have we're going to have factionalism. We're going to have we're going to have candidates get up and speak and say every, tell everybody they're libertarians and have a totally non-libertarian message, and that's what's going to hurt us. You know, in 2008, we finally got through to the media. They could tell you everything we had a position on, and after that, it kind of has fallen apart. <laughs> And I know everybody probably has about four questions our camera crew has to wrap up. Okay. And you're going to be around I'm for going to be while, around, so, so you, can come um, and, you can come and ask me anything. Yes. <laughs> so thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah.